Hello, ghouls and gals. I'm your host, Harlequin Grimm, and you are being haunted by the Mania Podcast. At your own risk, your own peril. Recall your nearest relic of St. Bartholomew. Keep your Bible close, your rosary wrapped around your fist, etc. Because we are about to delve, yes, quite deep into the territory of the unholy, the irredeemable, the fallen. Of course, if you are like me, just close your eyes and allow this to take you to a nice and restful place. This is a particularly auspicious episode, as this is the very first time in Mania history that a subject will have multiple parts. With so many fascinating details and anecdotes to choose from, I simply couldn't resist the temptation to do more than one story. The subject is demonic possession, and just as importantly, exorcism, the art and rites which attempt to nullify its effects. We'll be splitting it up into three parts. The first is possession, the second is exorcism, and the third is deceit. To be perfectly transparent, there are a multitude of exorcism practices, taking on different forms and procedures for each respective religion or culture. What I will be covering specifically are the exorcism rites and possession stories found within Catholic and Christian circles. This is a recurring clarification I need to make ad nauseum, it seems. The same happens even with the most bizarre of folk tales, like the Headless Horseman of Celtic origin, which I covered in episode 6. Yeah, well, guess what? There's a version which originates from the Middle East as well. And somehow these incredibly meticulous nightmarish conjurations seem to permeate themselves without regard to geography in multiple areas at once. So if anyone could solve that mystery for me, I would be incredibly grateful. Anyways, with a lengthy history which draws back from the ancient period, exorcist grimoires were widely used the further back we go, in the 15th century, just about any lay person could perform a rudimentary exorcism. These impromptu exorcists would use the Benedictine formula, Vade Retro Satana, <coughs> which, um, which translates roughly to st step, step Back s Satan. <coughs> Hold on. Oh, I just need some, some water. That was... Okay. Uh, this formula was found in a, a Benedictine abbey in uh, Bavaria, 1415. And, uh, yeah, even today this phrase is used by, by, by Catholic practitioners to, re to repel evil, driving back any would-be uh, mischief or malevolent entities. And uh, it's, it's true, even as I... <clears throat> let's, just, let's just move on. Let's get past that. Okay. These loose parameters on exorcisms and the possessed wouldn't last. Notice how I didn't say that they wouldn't last long, because they, well, they, they did absolutely last a long time. The first official guidelines for exorcisms were established in 1614. It would be as late as 1999, until these guidelines were amended once again by the Vatican. For an organization that prides itself on fighting the good fight against evil, I have to say they have, or had, an admittedly lax attitude with regards to maintaining the theory behind the foot soldiers trained to repel demons from the mortal realm. Uh, but you might be wondering what caused the change, and I was too. They were looked to for the first time in over three centuries because of an unexpected demand for exorcisms. For the previous centuries, Catholic exorcists were needed less and less in the United States, but with the rise of demonic subjects and topics in pop media, such as the popular film The Exorcist, more and more people were claiming to be the victim of demonic possession, and suddenly there was a spike of people claiming to be possessed, haunted, or otherwise tormented by demonic entities. Now, every diocese is required to have somebody trained to perform exorcisms, but the church was concerned with this sudden rise that there weren't enough exorcists on hand. Most importantly, there was the awkward question, was the Dark Lord and his minions launching a sudden frontal assault in the year 1999 after being dormant for centuries, or was this a case of hysteria spreading through popular media? To address the question, several things had to be examined and changed, and the change would be twofold on the part of the possessed, but also on the exorcist. So what did we know about the situation, and how did we go about changing it, or how did they go about changing it? Now, ostensibly, there were demons rampaging in the modern world, more active and alive in places like the U.S. than ever. Not good. Really not good. But more importantly, fringe priests were indulging these people who assumed the worst of their soul's corruption. 
These fringe priests were performing exorcisms that they had no right and no proper training to perform. There was a potential, again, in two aspects to be doing more harm than good. Firstly, if the victim was suffering from a mental illness rather than a sulfuric chokehold on their soul, these impromptu exorcisms would often serve to only deepen delusions and lead them astray from the proper psychological therapy. These were also giving more power to the priests than they actually deserved to have. This caused the Vatican to mandate that possession cases would undergo a rigorous psychological screening before anything would be officially deemed as a possession. Schizophrenia, mania, split personality, and a host of mental illnesses would have to be absolutely ruled out before the Vatican could sanction an official exorcism. This is what makes modern-day possession stories, when they are indeed verified by the Catholic Church, rather intimidating, perhaps unsettling subjects. Think about it. The Catholic Church, as an organization, is skeptical of jumping to supernatural conclusions and explanations for what appears to be hauntings, possessions, or otherwise. They openly admit it is exceedingly rare and, in fact, would rather hear that it is a mental illness. But, every blue moon, they feel forced, against every shade of doubt, to call it like they see it. Now we enter the early 17th century France, and the first point of tension behind the events you are about to hear. In a continuing effort to consolidate and centralize power, the crown ordered the walls around a town called Poitou and the Laudon commune to be demolished. The population was essentially divided on this topic. The Huguenots wanted to keep the walls, while Catholics supported the monarchy. During this time, The Devil's Army seemed to be crawling out of the earth, claiming lives left and right. In May of 1632, an outbreak of the plague was collecting scores of souls in Laudon. With a rampant disease, royalty and other individuals that could afford to had fled the city to wait out the outbreak. But within the walls, pressure continued to mount. As the plague roared on, communities isolated themselves more and more. Doors would slam shut not to be opened until days or weeks later, until the inhabitants felt brave enough to venture into the sick-ridden streets. Just six years prior, in 1626, the Ursuline convent was opened. At the time of the plague, the prioress was Jeanne des Anges. She presided over 17 nuns. Several months following the outbreak, with the disease's hold still strong on the town, peculiar reports began to spread throughout the convent. One sister Marth was repeatedly woken up by the apparition of a recently deceased confessor, a priest who the nun felt held her sins against her. The sightings were innocuous at first, if not unsettling. She would wake up to find him watching her from the corner of her room. At an attempt to get a closer look and strike a flame for a candle, the apparition would dissolve. Several nights of similar appearances occurred in succession until one evening when the nun was roused from sleep by a familiar chill. A sense of unease, like somebody had entered her chamber and was calling her name, to wake up or to be somewhere. Marth sat up, head turning to the part of the chamber where she was used to seeing the late priest's form. Instead she saw a crouched figure, small and with dark ashen skin, twitching, She wondered if perhaps a stray animal had wandered somewhere inside, but then she realized that it wasn't an animal at all, but it did appear to be eating something, whatever it was, as its jaws snapped and ground at what appeared to be raw flesh clutched in its hands, if you could call them hands. The nun noticed something else. The creature was looking directly at her all the while. Of what little moonlight leaked into the space, It cast a narrow glint on its small, black eyes, indicating its absolute fixation on her. Whatever it had been devouring quickly lost its importance to the demon 
when it noticed she was awake. It started first with a slow curiosity to climb down from the stool it sat on on all fours. The nun shifted backwards in their bed. She felt numb. She wondered when she would wake up, when the nightmare would be over. The imp continued to crawl towards her, a clawed hand grasping onto the frame of her bed. Smoke smoldered from where the wood touched its skin, a thick, vaporous substance that made her cough and wretch. Its mirthless expression remained focused as it slid closer to the nun. She could smell it now, too. It was a dense odor, like the bodies rotting in the streets after having succumbed to the boils and infected blisters of the plague. The smell of their waterlogged flesh and sun-baked skin left there as others were too in fear to remove them from the elements. Marth opened her mouth to scream as the creature drew closer. A thick substance like rendered pig's fat coated its hands. It reached up with a calm, analytical gaze and slid its hand across her cheek, smearing the tarry substance, what glistened with a dark hue. Just as the nun was preparing herself to run, she looked towards the doorway. It was open. She felt relief as, over the shoulder of the now-sitting imp, leaning closer to her, she recognized the silhouette of somebody in the doorway, somebody who maybe could help. As Martha opened her mouth to alert the figure, the words, again, were caught and choked back, like the scream that never left. There was somebody in the doorway, a man, but there was no surprise or alarm in his face at all as he was watching the spectacle unfold. In fact, Sister began to realize that the figure might have been there all along. She almost recognized his face, another man of the cloth in their convent. He was staring, only his eyes were white, rolled entirely back in their sockets. As the imp dug its claws deep into the Sister's chest, puncturing through the first layers of flesh, the last image she saw before the shock overcame her was the man in the doorway and his expression. He was, from ear to ear, smiling. Having heard full recounts of this event and others like it, Prioress Jian steeled herself to do what was necessary. More of the nuns were reporting stories like this as the months rolled on, and even though the plague was dwindling in the city, Whatever dark entities it had invited through the Calamity were evidently here to stay. By now, five months had passed since the plague's outbreak, but now her priory was experiencing its own kind of infestation. The apparition that Marth had first seen belonged to the confessor which presided over the convent, Father Mousseau, who had recently died. After Mousseau had died, the name of Father Urbain Grandier had been put forward to replace him as confessor for the convent, but Grandier refused the position. Jeanne approached the Saint Pierre Church, another church in Laudun. Parish priest Grandier himself invited Jeanne inside with as much hospitality and grace as he was reputed to have. With the plague weakening its hold on the city, the streets were lively again, and the people of Laudun were slowly and steadily working to put the past where it belonged. Grandier was well known, even envied, amongst parishioners. He is often described as being handsome, charming, and well-loved by those who visited his sermons. The problem, then, and the reason why Jeanne approached Grandier at all, was not because she was looking for help and exercising her ailing convent far from it. Grandier was, despite never admitting himself to her priory, reported within Sister Marth's experiences. Within the demonic hauntings, Grandier was a common figure, and not just in Marth's perception, who would be seen much like an apparition in the background of such events as the imp which stole into the nuns' quarters. Though they weren't always as vivid and intense as Sister Marth's, many of them feature the visage of Father Grandier. By now, over a dozen of the nuns were reporting convulsions, irrational behavior, bouts of uncontrollable laughter, and even being struck blows by unseen hands. Even then, as Jeanne was sitting across from the priest, Sister Marth was either writhing in her sweat-soaked sheets, or unconscious from exhaustion. The color of her eyes were dull. Deep, black, and indigo rings clouded her eyes, while her cheeks and eyelids were rubbed red from wiping away tears. 
She passed in and out of phases of aggression, snarling and cursing. She'd swipe at several of the nuns, leaving them with scratches which quickly became infected despite all precautions being taken against it. Other nuns were falling ill as well, though they weren't exhibiting plague symptoms. Whatever had dug its claws into Marth's chest had done something similar to the others. Their nightly visions worsened. No longer were they isolating themselves from the city for fear of a disease. Now they were the disease being isolated. Jien had no doubt it was possession by now. She could feel a heavy presence hanging over the priory. Their prayers became shorter, concentration more difficult, and thoughts wandered easily. Though none of them wanted to admit it, the nuns disciplined against sinful thoughts had all but dropped in the last months. They questioned their devotion, their faith, their chastity, and the life of poverty they avowed themselves to. Jeanne, in particular, felt that erotic thoughts were being imposed on her by outside forces. Father Grandier, hearing all of this and more, simply leaned forward and tilted his head, as if to suggest that Jeanne's story was far from over, though she had by now more than spoken her piece. The prioress looked away from his unremitting gaze, clearly unsettled. First, she was ashamed to tell him at all a priest of high stature and praise in the community. Then, as she looked back into his eyes, she felt it. They seemed to echo something, that atmosphere which choked her priory, the presence she felt as she eased herself to bed at night, the chill in her spine when Sister Marth had told her the stories through whimpers and choked laughter that rumbled with a voice and timbre that didn't belong to her. It smelled like the sulfur in Marth's room. It clouded like the demons haunting them all. Then Jian noticed something in her peripheral vision, something moving above them. Thinking it was a chandelier rocking left and right, Jian looked up to observe the peculiar motion. Sister Marth was hanging above them. Her limp feet swayed over the desk between Father Grandier and the nun. Her toes were blackened. A bone protruded through the flesh in her neck, and her mouth hung open. You should leave, the corpse said. Then a thick black tar fell from her lips. It splattered onto the desk, splashing Jeanne in the father's face, whose expression remained full of calm and pleasantry as the unbelievable spectacle folded out before them. Prioress Jeanne scrambled away, catching herself before falling completely out of her chair. She looked up at the ceiling, her lips managed to fumble a prayer in disbelief as she saw exactly what she didn't want to see. Then there was nothing, no hanging body, no vomit. But when the nun wiped at her face, she swore she could feel some of it still there. Is there something wrong? The father asked her. He grabbed something off his desk, a rose with wilted petals, and began to walk towards her slowly, as if this would somehow soothe her. He made no remark, and no suggestion that he saw what she saw, and yet there was this grin that suggested he knew exactly what was happening. He walked toward her slowly as she retreated. She didn't take his rose or his hand or any suggestion that he would be of any help to her. Instead, she got to her own feet, and as she left, glancing back many times as she did, Father Grandier just stood still, his hand still offering the wilted rose. He wished her well, calling after her in a forced tone of apology that there was really nothing he could do for her. In fact, he shouted after her with a chuckle that it didn't seem like there was a problem at all. These things just happen, you see. After Jean left Father Grandier to himself, he felt a very odd feeling standing alone in the church. It felt as if he'd just misplaced an object and had been looking for it for hours, as if he'd just awoken after a long, restless nap. He was standing between pews, rose in hand, outstretched towards the doors, yet he had no recollection of why he was standing there, who the rose was for, or indeed why he was looking to the door at all. The priest cleared his throat and looked around to be certain nobody was watching him or had seen the embarrassing confusion on his face. There was, of course, somebody watching him. The vision of Sister Marth's gray body hanging listless from the ceiling 
her bulging red eyes, those were watching him. As the father gazed about his empty church, he had the distinct instinct to leave at once and get some fresh air. But before he did, he went to place the rose back on his desk. Though he wasn't certain where it had come from or why, again, he was holding it, he felt it was important to leave it there. As he set it down, he observed that one of the drawers in his desk was open. He reached out to close it, not before noticing a piece of parchment with a peculiar signature at the bottom. Upon pulling out the form, the contract struck him all at once as entirely familiar and yet absolutely foreign. That's what it was, a contract. The ink across it seemed to move subtly, as if a worm in its last squirms. It was written in a language that was completely foreign to him. Beneath what appeared to be the terms being agreed upon were no less than eight signatures, seven of which were flung and interwoven with bizarre symbols that made him squint, trying to make sense of their often numerical origins. After a puzzling few minutes of looking it over and getting no closer to a conclusion, he realized there was one signature he recognized on the parchment. His own. The months wore on, with reports within the convent becoming increasingly more dramatic. In November of 1633, Monsieur du Lubard de Mont was commissioned to investigate the possessions. After Gien had reported the events involving Father Grandier, accusations quickly fell upon him. The priest was then accused of things entirely outside of the possessions of indecency and lewd acts. And quite quickly, it became evident that the visions and reports from the Ursulines all took on an undeniably erotic and fetishized slant. The increasingly extreme behavior of shouting, swearing, and barking on behalf of the nuns was drawing spectators and the public eye. Now, having attracted an investigation, the crown itself decided to intervene through Cardinal Richelieu, who was both a cardinal and a French statesman, and was chief minister to Louis XIII. Grandier had already offended Richelieu in the past with his public opposition to the demolition of the town walls, and now the reports of his illicit relations, as well as apparent manifestations within demonic visions, the odds were stacking against him. The investigator Lou Baudemont questioned and officially accused Grandier against all of the articles of accusation and facts placed against him, and after making him sign his statement and denials, swiftly proceeded to Paris to inform the court. Lou Baudemont returned to Loudon with a decree of the council dated 31st of May, 1634. Now this was a powerful document. It prohibited Parliament and all other judges from interfering in the investigation. It even forbade all parties concerned from appealing under a penalty of 500 livres. Before he could flee, Grandier was seized and taken to prison. On June 23rd of 1634, Grandier was taken from prison and brought to a church in his own parish forced to be present at the public exorcisms. Grandier vehemently denied the legitimacy of the possessions themselves, unleashing a torrent of resentment and confusion at his imprisonment, calling the entire commotion a farce. The irony of it all is that he himself was ordered to be the exorcist for the Ursulines, and was presented with the stole. Having no ability to refuse, he took the stole, and underwent with the ritual. The bishop of the city was present to grant him pastoral benediction, and after a hymn had been sung, he was permitted to perform the exorcism upon all thirteen nuns in the usual format. It was at once anything but usual. As soon as Grandier took the helm of the exorcism, the investigator and the bishop reported odd, painful sensations along their bodies. The nuns were chained to a stage constructed to fit within the cathedral. As such events and exorcisms often became public, this demonstration was no different. A crowd had gathered to watch. Previously exhausted, all of the nuns began to cackle, screech, and erupt with laughter. The symptoms they previously exhibited individually, they now demonstrated in absolute unison. Prioress Jin, in particular, thrashed against her chains until the wounds from her wrists drove deep enough to leave scars. By now, whatever had gotten a hold of her 
had dug itself in deep and made a home. The exorcism was abruptly halted by the investigator and was taken over by the bishop, Grandier now displaying a jovial, unsettling, and careless personality, divorced of the rage he had displayed just minutes before, was apprehended and taken back to prison. As he was dragged from the church, the nuns keened and called in mocking tones of sadness to see him escorted off. In August 1634, the case was heard before local magistrates. It was alleged that Grandier had made a pact with the devil and was found guilty of sorcery, in particular the casting of spells causing the possession of the Ursuline nuns. At the court of justice in Loudon, his sentence having been read to him, Grandier pleaded the investigator and the other commissioners to mitigate the rigor of his sentence. He wept openly, trying to explain through sobs his bewilderment and amnesic states, how he would awaken to find hours of his life missing with no memory of what he had been doing or with who. He claimed to be a victim of the same force which was haunting the nuns, even if he was helping perpetuate the affliction through it. This, unfortunately, went against his previous desperate attempts to deny the nuns' possessions at all. Now nobody was buying it. By now, Jeanne's states had worsened far past Sister Marth's. She rarely slept, and when she did, would frequently wander the halls of the priory in the dead hours of the night, mumbling in a language that sounded like crow's feet scratching against stone. The other nuns and exorcists grew too frightened of her to intervene or attempt to help. So the investigator replied that the only means to reduce the priest's sentence would be to declare his accomplices. Clearly, it seemed that this could not be done or invoked by one corrupt man. Hopelessly, the priest replied that there were none. The investigator and the magistrates were unamused by this, so much so that they submitted Grandier to several styles of torture, the most prominent being the boot, a style of torture which involves planks being bound to each leg. Then sixteen to eighteen wedges are just pleasantly nudged between the planks until the bones gradually and surely break. Even after both of his legs had been broken, Grandier confessed to no accomplices, and he gave no confession as to the accusations themselves either. Now, this was not uncommon behavior during this time. If a court dealt an accusation and no confession was given, innocent subjects would be submitted to the most grueling of tortures until confessions were forced out of them. This was a means of extorting out a narrative that aligned exactly with the court's. In this instance, Grenier was unbelievably strong. His obliviousness to his own possession or corruption allowed him to maintain his sanity throughout the torture, resisting the urge to stop it by admitting to the crimes. After they were done, the priest was utterly broken and folded at his waist, and ironically, what he still had left was his integrity. Father Grandier was a promise that he would be given a chance to speak before his execution. There were throngs of people on the summer day. The spectacle of a burning priest had drawn in hundreds, if not thousands. The crown, bishops, and high figures in both the church and political community had been dragged into this. All the while, the Ursulines from the crowd watched in greed of justice. But before Grandier could give his statement, before he could describe his mystification at the events, his innocence, monks started to throw large quantities of holy water at him. Now imagine having your legs shattered, one in which you will die by burning, and then being told you could, at the very least, say something to uphold your character, only to be sprayed with holy water with your hands bound to a post. Perhaps whatever haunted Grandier decided it had had enough. Perhaps it had decided that it had already divided the religious and political communities. A man's life was going to be spent, after all, and sacrificed. His legs were shattered, but his soul was almost certainly in ashes long before the fire was going to reach him. Grandier might have been hopeless, but never was there a man so alone than in that instance, staring out at the crowds, jeering at him, cursing at him, with parents shielding their children's eyes so as to not let them see the devil's face rearing itself in the flames. Grandier was promised something else, too. Another broken promise. He was promised that he would be given a quick death, or 
at least a quicker one than burning. As was custom for executions performed through a pyre, he would be first strangled and put out of his misery. But his executioner was, fittingly, an exorcist, and he was spurred by the enthusiasm and taunting from the crowd, and with a smirk, he lit the funeral pyre before Grandier could be hanged. Despite the visions, the nightmares, the accusations, the false evidence, and all the uproar, not a single life had been lost in the Laudun possessions. No devil scrambled up from the ground, dragging with it an innocent life back to hell. Except for one soul, that of a priest, tied and bound to his own incredulity. His flesh searing off, and his bones going all up in ashes, set aflame truly by ignorance. When they heard his screams, the onlookers would tell their friends, Don't listen, for that is the devil crying out. But Grandier's death achieved nothing, as the following months would illustrate with only more reports from the nuns, the devil's work, it appeared, had only just begun. As I wrote this episode, I thought about all the ways to turn it. It was one of the more difficult decisions I had to make. There were countless interesting moments and characters tied to everything. Moments that had their own narratives and stories demanding hours of investigation and possible avenues to explore. Really, you could write novels about this story and it wouldn't necessarily be enough. In the end, I synthesized the events into chronological order and simplified them to keep the particular integrity of the timeline intact. All of the characters mentioned were absolutely real figures in history, but much of it was exaggerated and fabricated, as the visions and the particular events in which the demons themselves manifested were left up to the imagination, it was a fitting place to input fiction. However, Grandier's position as the main culprit and suspect was completely true, and his death was actually fact, unfortunately. But in truth, this story is much larger than superstition and false accusations. It's a rather perplexing chaos of politics between the Protestants and the Catholics. As it often is, the individuals put on trial in situations like this represent so much more than their present circumstances. Grandier was seen as a ladies' man, being charming, and as silly as this is, this was a, a heavy uh, characteristic to consider. There's some historical writings which suggest that he might have sent in a formal petition to the church to rethink chastity for priests, and there were rumors that he ruined a few marriages, but there was no evidence to suggest foul conduct outside of these simply being consensual relations with the priest. Given the time period, of course, that detail is um, neither here nor there. Uh, this story isn't a tale of alleged possession and exorcism, not really. It's a story of oppression, rampant ignorance, and the dangers of delusion. The only spells present here were almost certainly spells of mass hysteria. Friar's Jean continued to be haunted by demonic entities long after Grandier's execution. There continued to be exorcisms performed publicly, until, miraculously, one day it was not the banishment of spiritual entities which saved her, rather the inclusion of more spiritual entities. Jian claimed that the intervention of angels and other divine spirits marched out the demons themselves. Then she was instructed by them to go on a pilgrimage. And she embarked on this journey, claiming to be free of the dark ailments which plagued her. It's a pity that they had to set a man on fire before she realized this. Laodun was a fascinating event because it was so divisive. The public was largely unconvinced of the possessions, there were a few psychologists at the time who came forward with their theories, but being afraid to be uh, lobbed in with the witch hunt, as it were, they fled the city and kept their mouths shut. Those who wished to avow its veracity had political or religious agendas almost certainly. The rudimentary psychologists at the time that I mentioned 
were skeptical that the life of a nun was conducive to mental vigor and health. The hours spent alone, the isolation, the repetitive lifestyle, poverty, and sexual repression, they were convinced were all collaborating and the more likely spell which summoned up these creatures and demons. Fiction or reality, Laodun is a touchstone for us all, a critical example and realization. Demon or not, haunted or not, a man died of the dark impulses which beat in the veins of those nuns, of the investigations, accusations, and very real life and death decisions spawned of their corrupted psyches. And he suffered one of the worst deaths somebody can suffer, and was tortured before it too. That is what matters. That is what possessed everybody who participated in the events themselves. I'll end this story on this final note, perhaps the only way I know how to end it. By what precisely, I do not know, but of this fact I am wholly certain. All humans are haunted by something. <clears throat> Alright, thank you for listening. Now, before I let you go, I have some crypt cleaning to do. Mania is taking on another musician, Ames Elliot. We are working on, an, or rather, he is working on an EP that will be dedicated to this project. And this is obviously extremely exciting for me. I've long since dreamed of having a soundtrack for this venture. Now, I don't have links or locations just yet, but be sure to follow or support Ames and his music wherever you find him in the future. If you have been enjoying this show, there are a multitude of ways to support it. You can leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to it. You can share with your friends, bring it to your next ritual sacrifice, or you can even support it monetarily at patreon.com forward slash harlequingrim. I'm currently not running ads or sponsors, so all that support is hugely helpful in keeping this show running. Lastly, if you have been around at harlequingrim.com, there are a few additions that I'm quite happy to announce. I have a more human, lighthearted blog called The Novice Aerialist, but perhaps more importantly, and something I'm much more passionate about, I opened up something else. The Black Carnival is a place where a motley assortment of very short fiction stories appear. I missed exercising my creative writing muscles, so this was my solution. Every week or so, there's a new, very, very short piece. The idea is to keep them flashy, engaging, and to make the imagery stick. It ranges from dark romance to horror to speculative fiction. So if you're into that sort of thing, that is now available, and I suggest checking it out. As always, it has been an honor being allowed to entertain you. Now, I sincerely hope you'll join me next time. <laughs>